Okay. My name is Lisa Spencer. I am an agender individual wearing blue light glasses, a shaved head, and a black hoodie. I am in front of a backdrop that shows the Northern Lights. I have with me Charlotte, who is wearing a blue hoodie and glasses with a ponytail and some hoop earrings. I also have Anne Borden with me as well, who is uh, wearing brunette hair tied back and a lovely peasant shirt with that's navy blue with uh, white uh, polka dots. We are here on behalf of NDMS. NDMS is uh, Nunavomi Disabilities Makina Swaktit Society. We are an Inuit-led nonprofit organization based out of Iqaluit, Nunavut. Uh, we started as a grassroots organization and have officially been incorporated as of 2005. Our mission and vision is for independence, self-determination, and full citizenship for all Nunavut living in our territory. And this particular uh, conference is about the National Accessibility Week. Um, National Accessibility Week runs from May 28th to June 3rd. It is uh, meant to celebrate valuable contributions and leadership among people with disabilities, to highlight the work of people and other organizations, and to uh, reflect on ongoing efforts to remove and reduce barriers to participation in society. This particular year, we're looking at disability across the lifespan. Uh, now with me, I have Anne Borden. Anne Borden King, who is a co-founder of Autistics for Autistics, Canada's autistic-led advocacy group. Autistics for Autistics is led by autistic people following the ideal of nothing about us without us. The group advocates for human rights in education, housing, employment, healthcare, and uh, public space. She's also a journalist based in Toronto. Autistics for Autistics can be found online on Facebook, Spoutable, or Post or on their website, a4aontario.com, and I'll put that link in the information section of this video. Also with me is Charlotte Hunter, who is a two-spirit trans-feminine zenial from the Abitibi Inland Historic Métis community near Temiskaming, Ontario. Uh, after short careers as a biochemist, a college professor, and an Aboriginal rights and family violence lawyer, Charlotte discovered that she was transgender, autistic and suffering from a debilitating genetic connective tissue disorder shortly after turning 40. When able, she now provides mixed professional and lived expertise advice to Indigenous women and gender diverse peoples organizations on issues of trans equity, disability justice, and housing and homeless for two-spirit people. So welcome. Thank you for joining me. Is there anything you would like to add to your introduction? Okay. So thank I you for having thank you for having us. It's oh, uh, it's really um, I I was surprised and quite honored to be invited. So thank you. Absolutely. Um. So our first question, we have um some stereotypes of autism as something that only affects white boys. Sometimes this belief is so powerful that people in First Nation, Métis, and Inuit communities may not even be aware that many of the girls women, two-spirit, and gender-diverse people in their own community are autistic right now. Why do you think this might be, and what are the results of this lack of knowledge? Charlotte, would you like to speak to that? Sure, thanks. Um, I know what it feels like to know, to not know what's wrong. Um, uh, even the even the stereotype that autism mostly affects um, boys, typically especially white boys, um, in in rural areas, even that stereotype isn't always that helpful. Because I mean, I was assigned a white boy at <laughs> when I was uh, young, and even that didn't help me get a diagnosis. So I I spent forty years trying to figure out what was wrong with me, and I think. In so in so many of our traditions and our circles, um, healing, you know, I, I mean, I was 40 years old and pretty messed up, like um, uh, homeless at one point, bankrupt at one point and could not figure out for the life of me what what was wrong. And so many of our traditions are about coming back to community and coming back home and coming back to spirituality 
And in the cases where our where neurodiversity has been maybe washed out, watered out of our traditions, coming home isn't really as help as healing and helpful as it should be or could be. And so it took for me starting to make connections to neurodiversity in my ancestry um, and and finding those like stories that were lost, the stories about like family members who had disappeared and family members who were a bit different, um, a bit witchy. Um, I mean, we, we've got a few hundred years of colonialism to untie some of the wording and mystery and 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 rediscover um for me it was about finding the neurodiversity in my own family and my own ancestry and finding comfort in that and um rediscovering the traditions and the community that has always been here but um even with two degrees <laughs> over the course of 40 years without the words and without the experience and without meeting other autistic people um, that was totally inaccessible to me, totally through ignorance um, and a lack ignorance in the form of a lack of information. If I may uh, ask a follow-up question, Charlotte, uh, you had mentioned that uh, discovering your neurodiversity brought you comfort. Um, coming from uh, an Inuit perspective, many of our uh, Nunavumiyat do not have the privilege of accessing a diagnosis. So is it possible to find comfort with self-diagnosis? That's a great question. And um, I work with uh, people from the, the far north on homelessness and housing issues. So so I understand, um, and, and I live in Northern Ontario, um, so I, I completely understand how difficult it is to get a diagnosis in the North, then add on as an adult, um, even me, I mean, I, I I live near several small cities now and I, I'm, I don't have a formal diagnosis at this point. Um, I, I'm diagnosed with ADHD, but uh, that, that and, and that was comforting in itself, but, the, but finding other autistic people and experiencing autistic spaces has been has been more transformative than pretty much anything else in my healing journey and despite being i guess i would call myself self-diagnosed at this point i'm i'm fairly proud of the fact that i'm not pursuing a diagnosis that aggressively because it's not really going to change that much for me in disabled circles at this point i have never once felt discounted in any way by not having a formal diagnosis inside disabled circles. So you found a sense of community? Immediately. Community and self-discovery at the same time. <laughs> if that's... Okay. Uh, our second question is in regards to identities. Uh, your organization identifies autism as a disability as does the rest of the neurodiversity movement, yet most Canadian policy does not. How does this affect design and access to social services for autistic adults in Ontario? Anne, would you like to start us off? Sure, I, I wanna say thanks to Charlotte. I was very moved hearing what you had to say and also to reiterate that self-diagnosis is very valid in our community. Uh, we don't require it socially in any way. Um, there's no stigma for anyone that doesn't have the diagnosis. Part of the reason for that is because it's it's inaccessible, um, not just geographically, but also financially. Um, the test for, for an autism diagnosis, each test is individually licensed by a company. It's very unlike other conditions. Um, it's very controlled. Um, and there's a whole institutional kind of... Um, deal around that diagnosis where you know you have they have to buy the test they have to administer the test it's expensive to have access to and then you're really looking at a question of well so so an expert with a three thousand dollar test says that I have this set of shared characteristics that 
all the, all the autistic people I know already knew I had, you know, so it becomes kind of a question of sometimes it's useful in terms of being able to access um, some services and things like that. But within the actual community to be able to become part of the community, it's, it's not a gate in any way, shape or form. We identify autism as a disability uh, throughout the neurodiversity movement because being autistic is a disability. We live in a society that was not made for us, uh, just like other disabilities and in, in, in ways that are unique to being autistic. Uh, but the problem in Canada is that Canadian policy doesn't recognize autism as a disability. There was a, a separation from the very beginning uh, where disability rights was happening in one area and autism charities were happening in another sphere. And the disability rights movement has done great things uh, in terms of access in housing um, and especially employment in anti-poverty work and in legislation, accessibility legislation. Um, but we were not, um, the government did not consider autism in any of these consultations for federal disability legislation, for provincial disability rights legislation. So what we are right now from a policy perspective in the eyes of the government is um, we're kind of objects of charity, right? The charities control what autistic people get or don't get. And uh, the governments follow the lead of the autism charities. That's a really big problem if somebody's trying to fight for their rights because the charity organizations are not are interested in their charity organization. They're not interested in our rights per se. They're trying to heal us and, and do all these things that they want to do, right? Because they're, they're not led by people with autism. None of them are, right? So I think the thing is that happens is what we want is to move Canada in, in its policy to move away from a, a charity perspective about autism towards a rights perspective. There were people with rights, even autistic children have rights and we have our own voices to advocate for our rights. We don't want parents um, you know, being the only voice for autistic rights. We definitely don't want charities being the voice for our rights. We want a legislative framework to be able to petition for our rights and especially our access rights. So we really hope that, you know, as adults, especially, it can be very challenging for someone to, for example, if you're autistic and you, you want to work, but you can't work full time, you want to work part time um, and you want to get some sort of help, um, you know, some sort of support from the government, such as Ontario Works or ODSP or or something else in another province or territory, it's very, very difficult to get any supports because if you're working part-time and you, you wanna work part-time because you like having the job to go to and the people to see, the government can start to claw back benefits from the money that you make. Or if you get like a, a one-off gig and, and you get some money from that, the government tries to claw it back. If you're even able to get those benefits to begin with, because, you know, saying that you're autistic doesn't necessarily afford you the right to any disability benefits. So what we have is a lot of people in our organization who are, um, they're living at home when they don't want to be living at home with their parents. Um, or in some cases, their parents have put them into very abusive group home situations. There's a huge homelessness problem as well in our community. And poverty is, I will say as someone on the board of A4A, poverty is like the number one issue that we hear about from autistic people, but there simply aren't systems in place to uh, protect autistic people and allow autistic people to thrive economically and very much similarly to the rest of the disability community. But in instances of specific discrimination, there's also no redress legally at all. So long answer, sorry. <laughs> No, it's much appreciated. Um, you did mention something that um, I would like to kind of discuss because there's a myth or certain misunderstandings uh, around this particular subject, but you keep mentioning voice our perspectives. And I do know that there is a little bit of a push and pull in the autistic community, as well as the parent of children with autism community, uh, talking about the spectrum of needs. And it kind of parallels your discussion about being too disabled or not disabled enough for uh, for certain supports or funding such as ODSP or Ontario Works. ODSP means Ontario Disability Support Program, by the way. I'm wondering if you had anything to say to expand on that idea of the binary. 
Yeah. I mean, I think that parents, um, first of all, I, I don't think it's all parents. Like we have a lot of parents in our organization and there are a lot of parents that are listening to the voices of autistic people and really learning so much about how to understand their kid and how to communicate better together. This is all really deep grassroots work. A lot of it's happening online and parents are really connecting. Um, neuro, uh, neurotypical parents are really connecting with autistic people around this. And it's been extremely helpful. And it's all being done for free by autistic people who just want to help. Uh, as well, I don't want to forget the fact that autistic people can be parents. I'm a parent and, and I'm autistic. So it doesn't mean though that I always, and my kid happens to be autistic too. It doesn't mean I always understand him, but you know, I, I try and I have a good deal of access to resources in the community um, to work on our sort of competing access needs. But I, so when we say parent groups, I don't want to say it's all parents, but I think that some um, autism providers and charities have really played upon the fears of parents to bring them into their fold and to tell them that, hey, we're gonna raise money and we're gonna find a cure for autism. We're gonna make your kid more normal, these kind of, of things, right? Or we're, we support this one therapy, ABA. It's the only way your kid's ever gonna be normal enough. And, and they really sell it really hard to parents and get parents to join them in sort of lobbying government in favor of, of therapies um, and, and, and a level of focus that we find it, it really is not helpful at all to our community. And then of course, you know, autism grows up and people become grownups and they get their own independence. And what we're seeing right now with the neurodiversity movement is autistic people who have grown up who've said, this system didn't work for me when I was a kid. And I want to advocate that kids get better things and it doesn't work for me as, a, as an adult. And I want to advocate that way. Now, the problem is up until very recently, only a few years ago, the government was only listening to the lobby groups. So we're a very new voice in the in the spaces of, of government. But I have to say that um, there's been a great deal of positive receptivity from the from, for example, the Canadian Senate was really happy to consult with us. So we feel like we're starting to get in on, uh, on the consultations, which is really good. Fantastic. I'm wondering, Charlotte, if you could kind of speak to that as well, just to expand um, what I heard Anne say is, you know, the concept of normal over and over again, um, which, you know, comes across as a bit of a colonial concept. How do you unpack that uh, from a, um, an Indigenous perspective? The idea of normal. I think those of us who were raised in non-traditional settings or a highly colonized quasi-traditional settings are still discovering um the answer to that question you know what has diversity meant for us as a people through time um i'm i'm metis and and our, our sort of our our legacy is like the laborer legacy and the hard worker labor the you know the dependable uh work yourself to death kind of uh tradition and and how to decolonize that into rediscovering our appreciation for our own diversity um is complicated i mean there's there's um there's no easy answer to that. And there's certainly no blanket answer to that other than um, to the greatest extent possible, almost every person that I have met who's on a journey of healing has found that reconnecting with their own community, however that may be, and however difficult that may be. You know, people who've been adopted away do not have an easy time coming home uh, to, a, uh, to a community with very limited resources and capacity. Um, but it's the only way I know of. I mean, my life changed in a in a healing lodge, a Cree healing lodge in the middle of North Winnipeg in the middle of January, like not where I would have expected it, but not through the social services that were supposed to be set up to be helping me at that time. Thank you. Um, as advocates, how do you see uh, federal, provincial, and territorial social services approaching autism? What's working and what's not working, specifically for Two Spirit? Anne, would you like to start? Actually, Charlotte, would you want to start on that one? I'm... 
I think Anne would probably be better to answer the the sort of the the national perspective, especially in the urban sort of setting. But I can tell you for two spirit people, what's the the main the, the two main things that that stand out for me, especially having a, a history uh, as a lawyer and doing a lot of um, family law and um, work with Indigenous parents, um, housing, <laughs> and um, the fact that uh, that most government programs and services have been administered to Indigenous people for generations under a deficit model, a, a disability, like a, um, a a cure to autism model. Frankly, I presented at a at a disability conference for the first time here in Timiskaming um, just last fall, and I was quite shocked to see the to see the parents who've been following Indian Affairs Protocol or whatever it is, um, their their local um, child and family services uh, are probably the most notorious for enforcing standards on parents that they have no choice but to follow, but that are rooted in not only colonialism, but that are rooted in a deficit model and rooted in a, a cure model. And there were parents it, it was heartbreaking for me to see parents standing up at that at the conference really expressing ideas that are a generation behind you know my child's not disabled my child is a hero you know there's <laughs> my child can do anything well actually your child will find out someday that they can't always do anything and that they might need supports and now is a great time to start finding the right supports for them rather than um meeting neurotypical trying to meet neurotypical milestones um but the reality of the child and family service system that we live under even um i i'm not sh too sure about other social services but um uh, i i know that being a two spirit parent is not all that um helpful in family court uh, so um and those those sort of attitudes, I think, still reverberate in housing as well. That that government policy for Indigenous people, all those social services for all neurodiverse um, Indigenous people is rooted in a deficit model, and that is perpetuating, especially among parents who have no choice but to follow those policies or lose all of their services um, as a family, even, you know, that's, that is a, a systemic example of, of government policy that is keeping us not just from succeeding in like modern life, but from, from culturally expressing our true selves, especially young people. Yeah, I, I agree hundred percent with everything um, that you said, Charlotte, I think that the child and family services, in my opinion, I can't offer an Indigenous perspective on it, but I, I can offer a look inside the world, I guess, of, of a white people being one, um, that child and family services is a very um, fundamentally racist institution, and it's deeply colonial, and it's it's caused unspeakable, you know, that needs to be spoken, um, pain in communities you know, in part through its missionary approach, uh, we still have the missionary impulse here in Canada and it's really, really problematic. If you look at applied behavior analytics, um, which we know a lot about because we a lot of parents contact us, they don't want their kids uh, to have to have ABA and the court will impose it sometimes. Um, there's, I've heard from parents who've had a custody battle and you know they're getting divorced and they don't want ABA for their kid and the court rules that their court has to have ABA. There was um, someone in North Bay recently who uh, got into a scuffle on the bus and an adult, and he was ordered, court ordered ABA, and um, he's indigenous. There is a lot of, a lot happening where um, the ABA system is kind of, 
their desire is to parachute that service and that therapy into Northern communities. They talk really openly about it and they sound like missionaries. They sound like they want to bring their way of thinking, which is a very normalizing and, and really troubling and abusive system that we don't support. Um, they want to bring ABA into indigenous communities and they look at it as though they're missionaries bringing the light of God into these communities. Well, they need help with their autism and the kids with autism. We're going to bring them this enlightening uh, program called ABA. And of course, ABA doesn't jive. You know, ABA is like the most extremely like um, tr troublingly Eurocentric approach that's actually everything that's wrong, you know, with with um, with Eurocentrism. And um, so, you know, we're trying to push back against that because, but it, it's so, they have so much um, money. Their lobby has so much money. They hire professional lobbyists from Bay Street, you know, to lobby, to have these programs expanded and expanded and expanded. And we often, it, it's very seldom that when someone's trying to expand autism services into say the North, I don't see a lot of consultation with elders about what people really want in terms of services and supports, let alone uh, tapping into the wisdom and perspective of indigenous people um, in communities outside of this sort of social services system that they're trying to just impose upon the communities. It's very, very damaging, can be deadly, and really, really troubling for us to see. So it has to be looked at. When you look at um, when you look at reconciliation, you need to look at what's, you know, not just for what's happened in the past, but what's happening now, right? If I can dovetail on that, if if it's all right, I I I should mention I like where where I've seen some innovation and change and and a willingness to try a different approach has not been at the government level. It's, and, and I mean, it's, it's been slow and it's been a certain amount of kicking and screaming, but institutions like um, the center for addiction and mental health in Toronto are, are asking two spirit people of their time and knowledge, asking autistic people, um, if they're willing to share their experience and compensate them for that and include them at discussion tables. And I mean, it's early days and I'm not, I'm not making any predictors on, how, on, on the, the rate or successes of change that, that, that may happen. But I, I'm just, I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm not inspired by hospitals, but I'm more, I have seen more, willingness within smaller institutions to try a different approach to involving two-spirit people or autistic people and or neurodiverse people from community in the work and compensate them for that and i haven't seen government doing that in a in any sort of um sin really sincere way you know thank you for sharing how can social services such as welfare and schools approach autism in a way that's guided by Indigenous communities' approaches to neurodivergence? Charlotte, would you like to start us off? That's a tricky one. Um, it's a really difficult one to answer because I would say my inclination is of course to say ask the elders and I think you can even tell by my hesitancy <laughs> to speak that my experience I was not I did not live through in personal involvement with the Child and Family Services Act but I worked as I worked as a lawyer in family court and CFSA court for Indigenous parents for several years. And I'm, I'm so inclined to say the answer to that question is go talk to the elders. You want to find about neurodiversity in our communities, 
first you have to get to know our communities in a respectful way. And that takes a generation <laughs> and then talk to the elders who are not going to answer your question because the legacy of the child and family services act and related, I mean, believe it or not, there's still members of, of our community really, really affected by prohibition. Like the legacy of talking about sort of the missionary approach to solving indigenous problems there's there's members of our community being court ordered to attend alcoholics anonymous still um which i have nothing I, it's not a, an attack on Al alcoholics anonymous but i mean it's a it's an example of where a, a judicial a, a judicial or or oversight body that is not indigenous that is that does not have a, a neurodiverse perspective is never going to be able to make reasonable decisions about someone else's healing journey and sending people to aba or alcoholics anonymous because it's a solution that's out there that can be summarized in one sentence um that's going to keep being the solution we get if we if we if we're just superficially asking the elders because we can't that we're not going to get deep honest meaningful answers that takes a generation or more of meaningful relationship building in a respectful mutual way and that's not happening yet. I agree 100%. And, you know, um, self governance obviously is like a huge um, a part of it, right? That it's still, uh, like you said, it's kind of a uh, non, this non indigenous oversight body imposing its will. And as long as you have that, you're always going to any any kind of um, neurodiversity approach is always a workaround. It's always you're doing it in spite of, of, of the, you know, white government like watching and looking and keeping track and and uh controlling you know what goes in and out of the community and everything else like you have to dis dismantling that is part of of getting the the problem solved and you can't solve it without chipping away at that our our community actually i live in um region three of the Métis nation of ontario and um we are We've been involved with self-government negotiations with um, both levels of government um, for a while, and that that's actually self-government for um, a, a different indigenous um, nation uh, was was what I worked on during my articles. And again, that is that is true. I agree with Anne. It is it is also an intergenerational process, and we don't have intergenerational planning. Thank you very much. Uh, I would love to continue this conversation. Perhaps uh, we'll have more, um, you know, a sequel. Um, but a lot of the things that you're talking about really resonates with none of it as well. Uh, the idea of um, looking for observable outcomes rather than relationship building and meaning making. So I appreciate that. Um, if you would like, just before you know, we end our time together. Um, would you briefly describe how Autistics for Autistics began and more specifically, how you managed to build a community of, uh, of mutual understanding in such a large province with a large geographical area? Anne? Yeah, so we started in 2017. Um, there was a chat group on Facebook that was run by Rishav Banerjee. And, and I believe he's the one who said, you know, let's start a group. Let's start a group like um, modeled on the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network in the United States. Let's get a group going. Let's start meeting with politicians and let's start finding each other and connecting with each other more than just through a chat group. Let's start to organize together. So we, we kept that um, chat group. We built a website. We, you know, once you kind of say you exist and you build a website and then you make some calls and you have some meetings and uh, and then you start to have a social media presence. And then eventually you might get some media calls if you put the right search engine optimization on your website and then you exist, right? 
we um we have we we recognize i mean um i'm based in toronto and i would say that i recognize um the the need to to work with with uh, with governments and uh and yet also the importance of community grassroots education that a lot of this is consciousness raising work so i've been talking a lot about policy but a lot of it's just changing our consciousness um our how we feel about ourselves how we understand each other um how our how our if we can get parents consciousness to to be a bit different about this and and we're a different kind of people so once you start thinking differently about us um you might start thinking differently about some other things too and and so it's it's really drawn in with with activism really well and and really easily especially for example anti-poverty activism um i will say when we we decided to raise the neurodiversity flag at Toronto City Hall, and that was very meaningful for for me as a Torontonian. Uh, we got we had one day we got a permit. We went there and we raised the um, the flag for neurodiversity, which is a infinity sign in the form of a rainbow, and we all met up in person because so much of our connections happen online. Um, and uh, we'll organize a protest. And then when we go to the protest or the flag raising, that'll be the first time a lot of us have ever have seen each other in real life, especially because we're from different areas. Uh, when we can come together in person, that's a really, really, really powerful, powerful moment for us. And uh, then when, when we have to do the work online, we also find really good ways for us to connect. A lot of a lot of people, you know, myself included, I, I love to communicate via typing. Um, some people only communicate via typing. And so we can often connect really, really well through the electronic means as well. And, and that's kind of what we're doing now. This is so new for, for autistic people. And we're connecting nationally as well to find each other through, we have a Discord group as well now and, uh, and other online spaces and then find ways to, to meet up like either for fun or for activism in real life. It's like, um, it's a really uh, exciting moment, I think, for us right now. Is there anything else that either of you wanted to add to the conversation that we haven't already touched on? Charlotte? I, I think it's, I think it's really inspiring that this, this topic is starting to be just discussed um in in the more remote settings because it's 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 just one more layer it might be one more generation it might be one more translation it might be you know one more a flight overnight flight to go see us it's 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 just layers and layers of barriers um and the cultural one is not the least um of them and so it's it's really fantastic to to see this work getting done uh, in the far north i think too like um as an autistic organization um you know we were i'm thinking about the flag raising the last flag raising that we did we had it all set up and then we found out that the city sends us this email at the last minute and they're like after you raise your flag, you're going to have to bring it down to half mass because the queen died. <laughs> and we were like, there's no way that's going to happen because, you know, we, there's no way. Right. And, and especially, you know, in indigenous members, but all of us were like, we're not going to do that. So what do we do? So, and it kind of symbolizes the way that we do have to make compromises, but not compromise ourselves. So what we decided we would do since everyone was planning on coming in for this thing. And we found out at the last minute, that we would bring the flag up, look at it, bring it down and just take it home and not let it sit at half mast for the whole day because that would look like like we were endorsing, you know, the colonialist system which we didn't want to do. So we ended up making that that kind of compromise when when we did it. But, you know, what came out of that too was a lot of conversation with members of our group that are are black, indigenous and people of color about what we, you know, need to do as activists in terms of listening, because I was talking about how policymakers need to talk to the elders. Um, but we do too, like organizations that are, are, are not specifically all Indigenous, like our organization, we need to connect more with the community and the entire Indigenous communities in our regions to figure out what 
what we don't know and to learn as well. Thank you very much for sharing your perspective. Um, would either or both of you be open to receiving um, any follow-up questions or concerns in regards to our discussion today? Yeah, that's fine with me, sure. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Great, thanks so much. My pleasure, thanks for inviting me. Nakulmik.